Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As Marcy noted, we are in the season of Lent, the Purple Paraments Give It Away. Lent is a time of reflection on our sinfulness and our need for a Savior and preparation for the joy that is Easter and the resurrection that is ours in Christ Jesus. But before Easter must come a death. A death that our sin caused. And so as we prepare for Easter and reflect on our sinfulness this Lenten season, we're going to be working through the miracles associated with the death of Jesus on the cross in Matthew 27. It started this past Wednesday on Ash Wednesday. If you missed it, you can watch it online on our YouTube channel or our website. Pastor Chuck told us about the miraculous darkness that covered the land for three hours immediately preceding the death of Jesus. After he cries out his last words and he breathes his last breath, he passes away. He dies on that cross. And Matthew tells us, tells us that, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. In order to understand the significance of this miracle, we need to understand the significance of that curtain. Our Old Testament reading from Exodus tells us about the curtain. It says that you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. This was a beautiful curtain made from the most expensive materials and dyes available. It was six inches thick 33 feet wide, which is about the distance between the two speakers on either side of the room, and 60 feet tall, twice the height of the ceiling in this part of the church, or about the distance from the door in the back to the step in the front on the center aisle. It was a giant keep out sign, as we heard in the children's message. God said that they were to put this veil into the temple into the tabernacle. It says, The veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And so behind that great curtain was where God would dwell. He would deal with his people from the mercy seat. But there hung a giant curtain separating God from his people and no one could go in except once a year on the Day of Atonement. You can read about the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16, but in our New Testament reading from Hebrews 9 and 10, the author of the book of Hebrews is talking about the religious practices of God's people and the Day of Atonement. He says that nobody could go into that most holy of holies except the high priest when he goes but once a year and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. Only once a year could the high priest go in there, and it required a sacrifice. An animal had to die, and the blood would go through the curtain with him to make atonement, to pay for the sins of God's people. And so that curtain stood for 1,400 years. But why a curtain in the first place? Why was it there? Well, the story starts back in Genesis, where sin drove a wedge between God and man. Adam and Eve were created to live in perfect harmony with God, in perfect relationship. But when they disobeyed God, something changed in that relationship. And Adam and Eve sensed it. Because one day they heard the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. But Adam and Eve hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They knew that something had changed in that relationship and they they separated themselves from God by hiding behind the trees in the garden. Well, God would condemn Satan and judge Adam and Eve and, and he would cast them from his presence says the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. 
God cast Adam and Eve out of his presence because their sin had separated them from him. Humanity would multiply and multiply until one day God would choose for himself a special people, the Israelites. God would make them his own special people. And they're in slavery in Egypt. God brings them out in miraculous fashion with the parting of the Red Sea, and they come to Mount Sinai. And it's there that they will worship their God. But even then... There was a division between God and his people. God told Moses, be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And you shall set limits for the people all around, saying, take care not to go up on the mountain or touch the edge of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall be put to death. God had come among his special people, but there was still that separation And God said, anybody coming on to the mountain must be put to death. David says about God in Psalm 5, 4, he says, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. And Isaiah says that your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear Sin had driven a wedge between God and his people, between God and mankind. And evil could not be in God's presence. And so they were kept off the mountain. While they're worshiping at Sinai, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And and after receiving the Ten Commandments and a, a bunch of other laws in the Book of the Covenant, Moses comes down off the mountain and he finds Aaron and the people bowing down to the golden calf. God is furious with his people. He's going to destroy them. But Moses intercedes and he says, God, we are your people. You can't destroy us. And so God relents and he's going to keep his word to take them to a good land flowing with milk and honey. But now, now something has changed. He says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up among you lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. This This was the worst fate imaginable. There was nothing good about that land if God would not go up with them. And so they they mourned and they grieved and they repented of their sin and they begged God to come with them. And so God provided a way with a curtain. The curtain is a message of law in one sense, a reminder of the separation that sin caused between God and man, but there's also a little bit of grace. Because now God could dwell among his people in that holy of holies, and the curtain would serve as a protection. And there were other divisions in the temple to keep people away from God, but, but that curtain would protect them from God's presence among them. And so as they traveled toward the Holy Land, they would take their tabernacle, their tent, and they would put it up, and the tent would go up, the, the curtain would go in, and God would inhabit the tabernacle, and the curtain would protect the people. Eventually, they conquer the Holy Land, and under King Solomon, they build the the temple. And that temple, too, has a Holy of Holies. And the curtain goes up in the temple, and it stays for 1,400 years. And no one goes through the curtain except once a year on the Day of Atonement when the high priest would go through to pay for the sins of God's people. And Hebrews continues to talk about the significance of that curtain. It says, by this way, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as that first section is still standing. 1,400 years that curtain was there, blocking access to the Holy of Holies. Until one day, God and man were united as the divine 
took on human flesh at the birth of Jesus. And Jesus lived a perfect life, and he died a perfect death, sacrificing himself on the cross, his body beaten and bruised, his blood spilling from the nails in his body and the whips that had cut him open. And when he dies, the temple veil tears in two from top to bottom. Friends, Jesus broke through this curtain for you. Jesus broke through the curtain for you. At his death, that veil tore because Christ had opened the way. The author of the book of Hebrews continues, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the the blood of Jesus, by a, a new and living way that he opened for us through that curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Jesus broke through the curtain for us. He sacrificed once for all time. It was his blood once for all time that paid the price for our sins. He broke through that curtain for you, and now nothing stands between you and your God any longer. Nothing stands between you and your God. Peter says in 1 Peter 3 that Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Therefore, Paul says in Romans 5, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Jesus broke through this curtain for you. Nothing stands between you and your God any longer. And nothing will ever stand between you and your God ever again. Nothing will come between you and your God ever again. Paul says in Romans 8, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing stands between you and your God, and nothing will ever stand between you and your God ever again. But Satan doesn't want you to know that. Satan wants you to doubt God's word. He wants you to think that that temple veil is still in place, that your sins have separated you from God. It's the same trick he pulled with Adam and Eve, getting them to doubt God's word. He wants us to to doubt God's word. A regular part of our worship practice here at First Trinity is confessing our sins and, and receiving forgiveness very early in the service. And often when we're doing that, We hear a verse from 1 John about how if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we come and and we believe God and and we take him at his word and we are confident that he is going to forgive our sins. But sometimes we come and Satan tries to whisper in our ear, and make us doubt that promise. You you don't really believe God's going to keep forgiving you, do you? I mean, you're here every week asking for forgiveness. Surely, surely it's going to run out eventually. I mean, how many times have you been here this in this pew and and you're like, God, this is the last time. I'm not going to get lost in that bottle ever again. I'm not going to look at things I shouldn't look at ever again. 
I'm going to stop losing my temper with my kids. I'm going to give up gossiping. I'm going to quit cheating at school. How many times have you said that, and yet here you are asking for forgiveness again? Don't you think maybe God's had enough of you? Don't you think maybe his forgiveness has run out? Maybe that veil is still up. But Jesus broke through that curtain for you. And nothing stands between you and your God, and nothing will ever stand between you and your God ever again, despite the lies that Satan tries to tell. Nothing comes between us and our God. And so we come and we meet with God in this place. The author of the book of Hebrews concludes this section from the beginning of chapter 9, the, the talk of the, the temple sacrificial system, the, the day of atonement, the curtain. He says, let us consider then how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, not neglecting to worship, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We come and meet with God on a regular basis because it is here that we are reminded that God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is here that God's word is read to us and the gospel comes to us. It is here in this place that God's word is preached the good news that Jesus broke through the curtain for you so that nothing could stand between you and your God ever again. It is here that God meets with us in a special covenant meal where the body that was sacrificed, the blood that paid the price for our sins, the body and blood of Jesus comes and meets us where we are in our sin and brings forgiveness again. Friends, the devil is going to try to tell you that the temple curtain is still there. But on that day when Jesus died, the veil was torn. He broke through the curtain for you. And nothing stands between you and your God any longer. And nothing will ever stand between you and your God ever again. And so we come and we meet with God in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.